Good morning, WOW women, and thank you for inviting me back to give another talk at the Thursday Morning Faith Lift. I really want to give a big thank you to Nancy O'Toole, who has been tirelessly putting together all of those um, summaries, those notes from all the talks every week, and uh, a really nice um, prayer list for all of us. Thank you so much. That's amazing, Nancy. And thank you also to Mel Nash and Loretta Steinmetz, uh, and especially Mary Call, who's done so many of these. Thank you for coordinating it so that we all have this to look forward to every week. Um, okay, so before I get started, I just want to ask the Lord. Um, dear Lord, I ask that you show us all how we may better act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Amen. Um, I think it would be an understatement uh, to say that we have all been feeling a little bit anxious, a little bit uh, stressed um, during this year, during this pandemic election time, uh, especially as well. Um, and it was to that, it was the election, in fact, that inspired me to do this talk. Um, I had been down in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and had the privilege of um, walking through a botanical garden there, and there was a placard with a nice quote uh, that really um, started making me think real hard about what's going on right now and how I might apply that uh, to helping to de-stress uh, and get through all of this. And the quote goes like this, and, and by the way, it's from the preservationist John Muir. Um, and deep into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul. Well, it's the word soul that really caught my attention. Uh, there's been a lot uh, said about the collective soul of our nation recently. And in fact, um, it was the Biden campaign's uh, motto slogan for the campaign, um, that this was the battle for the soul of the nation. Uh, Trump also uh, used the word soul in talking to his supporters. Uh, he said that we should not be looking for government to restore our souls, but in fact we should be putting our faith in God Almighty. So I was really, my interest was really piqued about, well, what does John Muir have to say about the soul? And um, how might I learn from his, um, his take on it? And how might I apply that in my current situation? Um, so I started looking into it a little bit deeper. Um, and the first thing I found was, in fact, that uh, this is a very old, yeah, the context, the con sorry, the, um, the concept of a collective soul is actually very old. Uh, it's, it's been around, um, it's very philosophical, very theological. In fact, I think Pastor Matt even had, had um, been talking about the soul versus the mind in a, a sermon not too long ago, uh, although I'm in a time warp. Uh, it could have been as much as a year or even more ago than that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there was, um, he was separating out soul versus mind. Um, and in fact, uh, the Old and New Testaments uh, tell us that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Um, so the Hebrews used the words nefesh and neshema from the root word to breathe, which is translated as soul, as in, in the creation story, when um, God breathed life into Adam and he gave him a living human soul. Um, so going back then uh, to John Muir, I remembered his name. Uh, I, don't, I didn't know a lot about him, but I had years ago uh, hiked through uh, John Muir uh, National Forest in California. So I knew he was a preservationist and had something to do with the national park system. Uh, so I decided I would look him up and if you go on, on the web, you find this um, Sierra Club's website. Uh, John was, in fact, the first president of the Sierra Club uh, when it was formed way back in the 1800s, late 1800s. Um, 
and they have an entire virtual exhibit on John Muir there and more information than you'll <laughs> ever be able to get through uh, his books, his quotations, his journals, his um, just everything. Um, and uh, I found out about his life there and I found out, and this is, I'm a little bit late to the party uh, because I think probably many of you women know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, he emigrated with his family um, in the mid-1800s from Scotland to Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, his father was a landowner there and a farmer. Uh, and um, John worked for his dad with the rest of his siblings uh, on the farm. Um, and his dad was quite a strict disciplinarian and actually... Uh, sounds like abusive at times, um, but uh, John was a gifted young man, and during the winters when he wasn't uh, uh, tending to the crops, he um, he was a very prolific inventor. He did, he made things like thermometers and barometers and clocks and a combination lock and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, but um, then when he was still quite young man, he went off to Madison um, and uh, he, um, went to the, the fledgling University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was in one of the first few classes of students there. Um, he didn't graduate, uh, but that's where he learned uh, and was inspired um, by his professors uh, to take up botany, uh, as well as some other things like transcendentalism and... Um, uh, um, some other studies that, that really um, grounded him in his desire to uh, spend time in the natural world. Um, and in fact, when he was there, um, he sought counsel uh, from one of his professor's uh, wives, uh, who was also very learned in botany, and they, they shared a lot of information. And she also um, was somebody that helped him um, unite his um, ideas about God and his faith um, with his love of the natural world. Um, so she inspired him towards that. Um, and uh, in fact, also, uh, a lot of his essays and his journal writings uh, are what inspired the uh, form, formation of the National Park System here in this country. Um, uh, he is credited with uh, starting uh, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, and Mount Rainier National Parks. Um, and in fact, in California, there are over 50 uh, monuments, education programs, um, trails, libraries, etc., all uh, you know, um, in his name, in John Muir's name. Um, and, and here in Wisconsin, uh, there's the John Muir Trail. Maybe some of you have had the privilege of um, uh, riding your bike or walking or hiking the trail near uh, Whitewater, Wisconsin. Um, but I will just uh, say that there is a little bit of a um, controversy about John Muir currently uh, in this climate of racial uh, inequality and demonstrations and the Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, he had had some associations with uh, some folks that were white supremacists uh, and racists um, during during his lifetime, um, and so some the Sierra Club was actually denouncing him and saying they needed to take his monuments down. Uh, but he has had a defender that has come forth and said, no, there's nothing in any of his writings, there's nothing documented that will lead us to believe that he himself was a racist, um, you know, other than the fact that he had a couple of associates that were. So that's kind of controversial and I think in limbo at the present time. Um, so, okay, so then how does all of that information apply to John's soul-searching or even more to my own? Well, John, um, because his father was such a um, disciplinarian uh, and uh, um, 
and sometimes phys physically abusive towards him. Um, he had a very fraught relationship with him, and, and he really found a lot of solace in nature. Um, and, and then especially in his correspondence with the professor's wife, um, being able to really work through um, his love and respect of God with God's creation, God's the natural beauty of the earth. Um, so, and of course, with all the journaling, uh, we have been able to to really benefit from that. Um, but too, um, it reminds me of, uh, um, well, I know um, several of you too have, have shared um, the natural beauty around you. I know Mary did a, a devotion earlier this summer from her cabin uh, up on the lake. And uh, a few of you, I think, have, have spent time in your own gardens while you've been uh, presenting um, your thoughts and, and devotions. Um, so, um, anyway, uh, thanks for those. Um, but when I think about um, the beauty of the trees, uh, um, I think about the, the promise that God made to his people, the children of Israel, to bring them out of 70 years of slavery in Egypt. And, and he said to them in Isaiah, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. I think um, maybe some of you have uh, sang that song in youth group or at your church camp. Uh, it's very joyful. The trees of the fields will clap their hands, clap their hands, clap their hands. Um, uh, it's it's a very joyful, uplifting melody. Um, the, the it's a favorite of the Jewish people, and they they often will perform it with a dance uh, during different Jewish festivities. Um, and there's lots of renditions of it um, on the internet. If you if you want a little bit more of a joy lift, uh, you can you can look that up. Um, Okay, and then I also wanted to um, share some of John Muir's uh, quotations with you that I also find quite inspirational. Um, before, before I show you a photo montage that I've put together to conclude this. Um, so, quotation number one. Climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. Number two, God never made an ugly landscape. All that the sun shines on is beautiful so long as it is wild. Again, these are from... Um, these are quotations from John Muir from his journals. Um, no synonym for God is so perfect as beauty. I really like that one. Um, gosh, there's nothing you can say over that, right? <laughs> that just says it all. God's creation is perfectly beautiful. <laughs> uh, and number four, in God's wildness lies the hope of the world. The great, fresh, unblighted, unredeemed wilderness. The galling harness of civilization, sorry, the galling harness of civilization drops off and wounds heal ere we are aware. Amen. Um, so that's what John Muir said in a nutshell. Uh, there's, like I said, there's gads and gads of things you can, you can read online. Um, but what do we know about um, the trees from science? Uh, there's been a lot of research about what trees do and don't do. Uh, and I think probably most people know um, that the trees are an integral part of our atmosphere on the planet. Uh, we need trees to absorb the carbon dioxide that we exhale, as well as a lot that's produced. Uh, um, from fossil fuel burning and et cetera, et cetera. 
And likewise, uh, so the, the trees absorb all that for their own photosynthesis, and then they give off oxygen, and so they refresh our air. I mean, a lot of people have house plants in their house for that. It refreshes the air. Um, so that's really important, of course, and that's a big argument against um, all of the clear-cutting that's uh, going on and, and, and contributing to global warming. Um, but besides that, there's been research that's shown that trees have a, good, a bunch of really good health effects. And uh, one is the reduction of the stress hormone cortisol. Uh, some of you might know cortisol uh, is produced when we're under a lot of stress. And it causes all kinds of things like um, high blood pressure and coronary artery disease and um, obesity and things like that. So any reduction in that, uh, of course, would be good for all of us. Um, and it lessens the anxiety. Um, tree, trees uh, can lessen anxiety and depression in people who are so affected, um, as well as moderating um, the behavior of people with ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Um, and then finally, another thing I found uh, in my reading about um, uh, trees and their, their healthful effects is that uh, at least in one study, um, they found that the levels of the cancer-killing white blood cells uh, in our bloodstream increase after we after some humans have spent a lot of time around trees and in forests and surrounded by nature so uh, if trees can do all that for us uh, certainly I think we can go there um, for the healthful support of our soul um, so especially uh, and, and and also to just worship God, right? Uh, it's, it's just such a natural fit. Um, so especially during this currently turbulent time with all that has happened in 2020 alone and the pandemic election and the election results are still unsettled and we have uh, the pandemic statistics still in continuing to rise uh, and now we're going into the cold season, into winter and there's potential isolation uh, and all the stress around that, um, I would encourage you to spend some time in the forest, whether you go in your boots or you go in your mind, uh, whether you walk the trails or you walk the internet. Uh, there's, there's a lot that we can find there and you'll find restoration for your soul as David did in Psalms 23. And finally, I wanted to share this little tidbit. Um, you know the Dove chocolates, the, the little, you know, little squares of chocolate you get the, the Dove brand. They have the foil wrappers on them that have little quotations in them. Um, I found this one and I have to give credit to Lane R. of Ohio. So I will say to you, go to the trees and I quote, inhale the future and exhale the past. And now I hope you all enjoy the photo montage and God bless you all.